is Emma Rabson from the Plymouth Marine Laboratory. And uh, okay, carrying on this uh, on this subject, uh, she's going to be talking about the wonderful world of marine biology. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Emma Rabson. I'm from Plymouth Marine Laboratory, and I'm actually, unlike everybody else, don't particularly have a job at the moment. I'm actually a PhD student. It's amazing how long you can stay a student once you finish school. I think I've now done an undergrad, which was three years, then a master's, which was a year, in marine biology. And now I'm doing a PhD, which I'm right at the end at, um, in coral disease. So, as I already mentioned, um, I'm from Plymouth Marine Laboratory. And if we go there, where that red star is at the moment, Plymouth is right down in the southwest. Much nicer weather than up here. And um, although this is one of the marine biology labs, I don't know if you can see all the dots, but there's plenty of other marine biology labs all over England and the UK. The nice thing about Plymouth is that it's actually got five different labs down there, so it's a real hub of marine science in the UK, and a great place for students to go for undergraduate and uh, master's uh, work. So just to give a quick overview, I'm just going to talk about what marine biology is, why it's important, life, what life is like as a marine biologist, and, also how, and then how to become a marine biologist, if any of you are interested. So as you can see, there's a range of different work that, that we could do. So what is marine biology? Well, it's the study of marine organisms, their behaviours and their interactions with the environment. And it includes studies from the micro to the macro or the massive. So it includes studies like um, on plankton, um, which are microscopic organisms that sometimes are, are zooplankton. So you can see on the top left the, the fish, so the, la the larval stages of marine animals. And also microscopic uh, plants. Um, and all of these organisms, although they're only very, very small, they um, are food for a lot of the bigger organisms that are very important in our marine systems. Marine bacteria are also very important, and this is actually what I study. Um, they're they're free-swimming in the water column, so you get about a million bacterial cells in one teaspoon of seawater. However, they also have relationships with lots of the higher organisms um, in the marine environment. So this is the bobtail squid, and the bobtail squid takes in luminescent bacteria that can glow and uses this to deter predators when it's out at night feeding. So although marine bacteria are only very small, they have lots of, uh, lots of uh, roles in the marine environment. And of course, from the micro, this goes all the way up to the macro, so the biggest known animal, the blue whale, um, which is a heart the size of a small car. Um, and then everything in between. So you've got your corals down here on the left, and then your sea cucumbers, which are like massive uh, slugs in the marine environment. Uh, your crustaceans, so your burrowing shrimps, and then all your different species of fish. Now you may ask why all of this is important to know about the biology and the physiology and the way that they interact with the environment. And such is the behaviour of the sea cucumber, although it, it, you know, it's important for uh, subtitle uh, ecology. Scientists have also found now that in, in aquaculture areas, such as this fish farm, uh, they can be used to clean up the seabed underneath. And this is a massive problem for fish farms and environmental impacts. Um, scientists have also found that after that, they can be used for um, a new protein source, which I'm not so sure I'd want to try. Um, so why is it important? Well, the oceans contain 99% of the living space on the planet, um, and less than 10% of this has been uh, explored by humans to date. Now, the ocean isn't a pristine environment anymore. We're having a huge impact on the marine environment. So, for example, each year three times as much rubbish is dumped into the world's oceans as, as the fish caught. And this has a huge impact on marine species. The reason we don't see these rubbish, this, this huge amount of rubbish, is because it collects in ocean gyres, so in the middle of the ocean, where the currents take it. Um, and although you think, well, there's, you know, lots of marine species are being affected, these plastics especially um, will... Uh, work their way up the food, food chain through um, chemicals that are released into the animals and end up with us. So it's important to understand all the effects that we're having on marine or organisms and how they will affect us eventually. Um, another one is noise, noise pollution from ships, which Tina talked about, so I'm not going to go too much into that. But it's not just about the, the ways that we're affecting the environment, and that's why we need to study marine biology. Um, we also have different uses for the marine environment. So, 
Um, we found a number of marine derived agents that are in clinical trials. So there's lots of marine biologists out there sampling the marine environment to see if we can find anything that will help us and the way that we live and, and maybe some new drugs. Um, so overall, it's to help us understand more about the marine environment, to help us understand how we're affecting the marine environment, how we can conserve the marine environment for the future, and also how we can use it to its full potential. Um, so I just want to give you a couple of examples of the sort of research that we carry out. Um, and this is actually research that I carried out for my master's work. So although I'm, I'm still a student, there's lots of interesting research that you can do uh, while you are a student. So I don't know if you're aware of ocean acidification. It's the other climate change issue. Um, and this is just a, a sort of way of how we're affecting the marine environment. So what happens is all the carbon dioxide that we're producing, a lot of that, about a third, gets put back into the ocean and dissolved in the ocean. And that means that we haven't got so much carbon dioxide in our, our atmosphere, but what it does mean is that all of that is going into the ocean and cre creating a more acidic environment. So when it goes in, it gets dissolved um, into CO2 and water, into carbonic acid, and this means that a lot of marine organisms can't calcify or they can't uh, make their shells as, as uh, well as they could previously. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of the ways in which we marine biologists look at these sort of studies or this sort of problem um, and the way that we determine how marine organisms will be affected is by doing mesocosm studies such as up at the top. So we take animals out of their natural environment and we put them in essentially big tubs of uh, acidified water and see what the effects are on their behaviour and their physiology. However, sometimes we get the opportunity to go out in the field as well. And this was a really exciting study. This is um, down in Italy, um, out of the Bay of Naples. And here, there is a massive CO2 venting system. So it's a it's cold water vent, so it's not like the hydrothermal vents that were talked about earlier. And there's all this CO2 bubbling through the ocean uh, because of volcanic activity below the surface. And this creates an acidic environment. So it means this was the first study site that you could go and you could look at in, in a whole ecosystem and how acidification is having an effect on that ecosystem. So we went out in 2007 and 8 and we looked at uh, vent and gas uh, composition. We looked at the biodiversity of everything that was there and the ecology of these ecosystems. And we found that with decreasing pH, um, so 8.2 is what we're, we're seeing at the moment, and 7.8 is what we think we might see within the next sort of 100 years. And then right down at sort of 6.6 .6 is the sort of scenario you would get if you tried to store CO2 in the seabed and then there was a leak. Um, so first of all, we found that a number of species suffered, so all of your calcareous or calcifying organisms decreased in these low pH areas. And then we also had species that, that increased their abundance and performed very well in these environments. Uh, we also found that, um, so the epiphytes or calcareous, um, calcareous organisms that live on sea blades, on uh, Posidonia blades, decreased. Um, and we saw that, I don't know if you can see, but right at the bottom, your limpets, all of your calcifying organisms, end up with these very, very, very thin shells. So it, it means that they're much more vulnerable to predators and their numbers decrease. So this, this, this sort of study is extremely important to understand what our future marine environments will look like. And that has an impact on, on the marine biology, but also possibly on our food sources. Um, a different um, piece of work that is also really interesting is it's something that's been talked about a little bit, but about the distribution um, and behaviour of marine, marine species. So this has this sort of research is a way of finding out how we can conserve the marine environment by finding out what these organisms do and where they are. So as already mentioned, uh, the UK is trying to, um, at the moment, put in a whole number of marine, marine conservation zones to complement all the areas that are protected already. Um, and this will create a network to um, <coughs> Sorry, this will create a network to preserve both habitats and species all over the UK. But the way to do this, the marine biologists have to understand what these species, who these species are and what they're doing. So we do development studies to see um, how climate change and pollution are affecting the marine species around the UK. We do behavioural studies to see 
how these species move and how they act as groups, so such as fish. Um, and we also do uh, tagging traces, so we put these uh, small little tags on lots of different marine fish, and from that we can understand where they go, so we know where the areas that are important for their feeding grounds and their uh, breeding grounds are. So here you can see that you've got your uh, small library that is in the shallow marine environment and then drops down and you can get an, an idea from when you've put the fish back in to where you follow the tagging traces to where they've gone. Another area is marine drug discovery um, and this is how we can use the marine environment to its full potential. So uh, these uh, slides are taken off the internet actually, these pictures, and we go both shallow in shallow water and deep water and collect a number of marine organisms. And this is something that Plymouth Marine Lab does a lot of, um, such as sea anemones and corals and sponges. And you can extract either the bacteria that associate with these corals or, or, or organisms, but you can also look at the organisms and the secondary metabolites that they uh, produce and see whether or not. Um, and then you can test these compounds or bacteria for action against marine pathogens or for proteinase activity, so the ability to break down uh, cells, or hemolytic activity, so the ability to break down blood. And all of these types of tests are really important in um, finding new, new drugs and cures for known diseases that we have, anti-inflammatories or pain medication. So how do we carry out our investigations? Well, I'm guessing the majority of you do marine biology or some sort of science. And so the process is quite simple. We ask the question, how are microplastics a danger to the environment, for example? And microplastics are found everywhere. They're found in the clothes, they go into the washing machine, and then they, then they get washed out to sea. And it's actually a massive problem that you may not think about. Um, we get some objectives, so we choose a, a species or a group of species to look at. So we're looking at the zooplankton, so the base of the food web, and see whether or not these species actually ingest these microplastics. Um, so we, we carry out some methods, and sometimes it's quite simple. So sometimes you'll take the animals and subject them to a stress. Um, and then post-exposure, you will look at them under a microscope and see whether or not these have been ingested. And the results are that yes, they have. They, they've got these little green particles or all the microplastics um, ingested into these. And these will then carry up the food chain into fish and possibly up to us if they aren't um, taken out of these animals before that, so if they don't um, excrete them. So this is a very new area of research and it's, it's a very basic question. And from that will become more detailed studies into, into microplastics and their effect on the marine environment. So just a few pictures to kind of sort of quickly go through. So there's a lot of lab work we do. As, as I said already, we do lots of mesoplasm studies where we subject lots of animals to different conditions and see, see what the effects are. Uh, we also do taxonomic identification, so we identify lots of different species in the lab under the microscope. Uh, physiological studies of tissues, and then your microbiology, and lots of molecular work, so looking at the genetics of marine organisms. We also do lots of field work, so these pictures are a friend of mine in the Arctic, which was a, a great trip, supposedly. And uh, up on the right you can see they've actually got in-field mesoplasms, so they've taken big bodies of water and, and taken the plants in there, subjected them to different um, CO2 concentrations in the environment to see what the effects are on, on community composition. Um, you also get lots of uh, diving work and underwater stuff, and also lots of intertidal work. Um, but we also do a lot of cruises, so we, we go out for about six weeks at a time. This was uh, the transect that a cruise took from the UK down to the um, southern tip of South America. And this is generally six weeks long, so you have to like the company of others and small spaces. Um, but you go out, you get amazing views, you get to see lots of marine species, and you take lots of samples, so you take studies for phytoplankton and bacterial samples. You take, this is a rosette sampler, the circular thing. Um, and this takes samples of water at different depths, so you can get depth transects um, all the way down thousands of metres, or a thousand metres. And down on right at the bottom on the right hand side is a plankton troll, so that's how you collect your plankton. And then on the ships you need to do some analysis um, of your samples straight away. 
And some of this is done in the lab, although it's quite confined spaces. But it's not all great. I mean, it's a, I love my job, and you get to see some amazing places and do some amazing work. Uh, but sometimes you do get stuck in the middle of a lagoon, 30 degrees heat, and end up with a burnt backside. Sometimes you end up face down in seagrass meadows for hours in the cold English water. Sometimes it snows on you, and sometimes you spend too long on a ship and end up going a little bit crazy and messing up. So, but it is great. You do get to travel all over the world. So this is, um, PML is the central point in there where I work. And this is all the collaborations that we have with different area, different marine labs in the world. Um, so at, at me as a marine scientist who has been doing this now for about six years, in that, in that time I've been to Bermuda for a, for a summer school on oceanography. I've been to France um, to a massive um, symposium on climate change and how to communicate climate change. I've also been to Italy for two months to do some field work for my masters and over to Israel to do some work for my PhD <coughs> on coral disease. So if you like traveling, this is a, a great job to have. But we also share our science. I mean, the whole point of doing all this work is to, to disseminate it to all of you and, and to try and make changes in the marine environment. So we publish lots of scientific papers as our number one goal. We collaborate with scientists all over the world. But we also talk to the public. So we have lots of um, public outreach activities where we try and um, inform the public about the marine environment and how it's changing. And we also sometimes go to government and try and work with them on policies that may be up and coming. So just very quickly, if any of you are interested in becoming a marine biologist, um, first of all you have to stop thinking about how good you look. You uh, often look, well, wear very interesting attire to go to work. Um, but there's lots of things that you can do um, while you're still at school, so you can... Um, the Marine Biological Association has lots of different uh, projects where it involves young people in identifying things on the seashore. It also has a new one called Life Around the Turbines, which is all about marine wind farms. Um, and you also can do identification of um, invasive species that have been brought over in our part of our natural environment, and such as the Chinese mussel crab, which you can actually find in the Thames, so you can go down in London and, and find this organism and count it and give us the information back. Um, you can also do work placements at lots of these marine laboratories, so if you're interested you should find one that interests you and, and see if they can take you on for a summer's worth of work. But the most exciting bit that I loved when I finished school was um, conservation projects that you can find all over the world. And these involve marine biology and conserving uh, marine species. So I went to Greece and worked on sea turtles for three summers. Uh, so I was out living in a tent for seven months at a time. Um, and also the, there's a shark projects and all sorts of other marine projects all over, all over the world that you can go to for very little money and get a bit of experience in marine biology. So as mentioned before, um, astronauts were the cool thing to be about 20 years ago or so, and now I think it's marine biologists. Thanks very much. <laughs>